All right, what we're gonna do today is something that I'm calling reviews and cut time. So we all know that most of my videos are 25 minutes long, hard to sit through, right? So for some of these reviews, especially these shootouts, I wanna do something that's a little bit, um, a little bit more trimmed down, do some of these reviews in brief, um, and leave some of the long-witted stuff for other topics. So what I'm gonna do here is cover Jazz Impressions of Black Orpheus, the one step, compare it to the original, and we're gonna do this in two parts, first the history and then the music. All right, so in case you don't know, Black Orpheus was a 1959 film, which was based on a play, which was then based on a Greek legend. Um, so the movie helped launch the careers of two musicians who have kind of come to be known as um, not necessarily jazz, but almost like pioneers of bossa nova uh, here in the US. And those include Antonio Carlos Jobim and uh, Luis Bonfa. So the movie won the Palme d'Or at the 1959 Cannes Film Festival. It won a 1960 Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film, won the 1960 Golden Globe for uh, Best Foreign Film as well. So a couple of years later, in 1962, Vince Guaraldi decided to make the album Jazz Impressions of Black Orpheus, which was obviously inspired, inspired by the movie, which was inspired by the play, which was inspired by the Greek legend. Um, and this album was really considered his breakout as a leader. So Guaraldi had previously been playing with Cal Jader. Uh, he had been playing with his group for years in the 50s, hadn't made an album of his own since 1958's A Flower is a Lonesome Thing. Now, Black Orpheus was quite successful upon its release, mostly because of the hit single, Cast Your Fate to the Wind, uh, which appeared as the first track on side two, I wanna say. It itself, that song, won the 1963 Grammy Award for Best Original Jazz Composition. It was so successful that almost immediately they added this like hype sticker to the album cover advertising the song, and then soon they actually redesigned the entire album cover and simply uh, titled the album Cast Your Fate to the Wind. Um, to that point, it's actually only side one that has musical interpretations from Black Orpheus. Side two is all originals and then, um, well, it's like two originals and two standards. So why this is even more important of an album is because Lee Mendelssohn was looking for someone to score a documentary about Charles Schultz, the cartoonist for The Peanuts. And he had heard Guaraldi's Cast Your Fate to the Wind, probably on the radio, and reached out to him. Now, the documentary that they put together never actually came to fruition, but Guaraldi was then given the opportunity to do the score for A Charlie Brown Christmas, and the rest, shall we say, is history. So this album has had a number of reissues over the years, and a few of them I think are more important than others. Um, so one is the 1983 Half Speed Master by Mobile Fidelity. I think that was the first high quality reissue that was attempted. There was also an Analog Productions 45 RPM reissue in 2003 that was mastered by Steve Hoffman, the famous Steve Hoffman, and Kevin Gray. Um, so that brings us to today with this year's release of two different editions of the album. One is a triple LP edition, and the other is a small batch, one step. Um, so the triple LP, or what they're calling the deluxe edition, has 16 bonus tracks on it, including outtakes and then alternate takes as well. In that edition, the original album is cut from the analog master, and the bonus content is transferred from the original analog tapes and remastered by Paul Blakemore. Now, the lacquers for this edition were cut by Kevin Gray and Preston RTI, 180 gram vinyl, so a lot of great things, a lot of attention placed on that deluxe edition. However, the small batch One Step, which by the way is limited to 3,000 copies, <laughs> was cut from the original analog tapes by Bernie Grunman, also pressed on 180 gram vinyl at RTI using their one step lacquer process as opposed to the three step process that's traditionally used. Um, so you'll note that these are indeed completely different pressings. So let me say up front, I've never heard the Mobile Fidelity Edition. I've never heard the Analog Productions Edition. And I've also never heard the Triple LP Deluxe Edition that just came out. So what I have, what I want to talk about, <laughs> is the original pressing, which is this right here, um, and then the One Step which looks like this, right? So this is that craft recordings, um, you know, sort of special edition that they did for Lush Life, that they did for Eastern Sounds, um, that they did for Relaxing by Miles Davis. This is the fourth iteration of that. Um, and yeah, this is what it looks like. All right, so let's start out with the first pressing. So my copy is an original stereo and it is on blue vinyl. Um, the problem is, is that fantasy color vinyl records don't really have the best reputation. I don't know if it was just fantasy across the board or whether it was specifically these color vinyl variations, but a lot of them had a more pronounced noise floor than you would expect. 
and this one does as well. And it also has some surface noise in the form of some ticks and some pops. So it is a little bit difficult to, uh, to compare, but the problem is, is that it's so hard to find an original fantasy edition that actually plays flawlessly that doesn't have some of these issues. So um, let me see what I can say about it though, even considering, uh, considering that there's some damage. So it does sound good. Um, the stereo separation is fine for the most part. It's always hard uh, to talk about how the album sounds in terms of its sonics without talking about it in relationship to what I'm comparing it to. So um, starting with the famous song, um, Cast Your Fate to the Wind, I will say that the bowed bass is pretty understated. You don't even necessarily notice it overtly. Um, you notice the bass, but not necessarily the sections where it is uh, being played with the bow. Uh, let's see, the cymbals are in the right channel and they're dynamic, but not necessarily detailed. So what I mean by that is that they sort of shimmer a little bit, uh, but sound a little bit one dimensional at the same time. Uh, same thing with the bass. It's there, but you don't get as much detail with the attacks or the, or the uh, sustains. The piano doesn't exactly sound natural, like in the room natural. It sounds, well, I don't know, like recorded or produced some. I don't know to what extent the levels would be adjusted to have it be better balanced um, with the other instruments. It's possible, um, but it, it doesn't sound like it's being treated the same as the other instruments. It sounds almost like that they were recorded separately because they just don't have the same type of sound quality, almost like like the, the feel of the room for the uh, the bass and the drums is different than what it sounds like for the piano. All right, now I don't think it's fair to just talk about this album in terms of one track, um, but for the sake of brevity, I will just talk about one more, and that's the opening track on side one, Samba de Orpheus. It's a fun sort of bossa beat with just percussion and bass for an extended section up front before the piano comes in and it gets louder. So here the drums to me sound a little muffled, like they're being played in a closet. It feels like the piano is more in the left channel, um, which by the way, isn't consistent from track to track. In fact, the bass and the drums swap places in the channels between the first and second sides, and possibly some more on the second side, but at least between the first and second sides, which is a little unusual. It, it doesn't necessarily give the, um, the album a cohesive feel. Um, in my copy, the piano also cuts out um, at one point in the left channel and then sort of moves to the right with a little bit of that echo. It's super brief, but it's definitely there. And I don't know if it's just a flaw in my copy or if it's a flaw in all of the early copies. Uh, let's see, the bass gets muffled and borderline distorted in certain sections where it feels like it's, it's trying to compete with the louder piano sections. And that's a little weird too. So the, the challenge here from an engineering standpoint is that it goes from loud uh, with piano to soft without it pretty frequently. And the musicians and likely the levels uh, needed to be adjusted. And so, you know, like I said, it's, 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 it doesn't really have a cohesive feel to it, both in terms of, um, you know, from song to song, but also even within it, because it feels like the levels are being brought up and then brought down. Um, and so, yeah, it, it just, it doesn't sound as natural as it could. All right, so let's move to the reissue. This is again, the uh, the one step. So on Samba de Orpheus, the drums and piano sound brighter and the bass is more detailed along with really all of the instruments. There's more nuance. It definitely sounds more natural, like they're all playing in the same room. And in fact, generally you do get more of an in-room sound to it as well. Like when you're listening to it, it does put you in that recording studio much better than, um, than that original, which is um, which again kind of lacks that consistency, and but especially in terms of how individual instruments are treated. Uh, with "Cast Your Fate to the Wind," the bowed bass is definitely more pronounced. You hear more of that sort of bowed string sound uh, that has some high end uh, detail to it, with like the friction of the uh, of the bow against the strings. Um, the snare drum is more detailed. The cymbals sound a bit hotter, but they don't necessarily have like splashy sustains on the sound it's actually simply crisper. Like they, they just sound like they're like, you know, the, uh, the high end um, sort of crispness uh, uh, that you might expect from like a ride cymbal. Um, so there are better sustains on the piano notes as well. And I think that it makes it sound much more natural. So rather than piano notes um, sort of getting just chopped off because you're, you're, you're not, you don't have the, um, the detail in the sustain, you have more of that. And, and again, it adds to the natural feel of the song. So of course you know where this is going. I prefer the One Step by Kraft. Uh, it sounds great. It sounds much more natural, more um, you know, more detailed. It's just a much more pleasant experience. 
And um, I don't know, maybe that isn't necessarily what you would expect, because if I'm remembering my comments when I reviewed Relaxin by Miles Davis, um, you know, yeah, there was more detail, but it was also just so loud and, and it didn't um, it didn't necessarily sound natural. It was almost like they went overboard a little bit with the hotness of um, of, of how all of the instruments sounded. Um, to, to the to the extent that you you would need to like turn it down while you're while you're listening to it, this one doesn't have that. It, it doesn't feel like it's going so overboard, and it's not it's not really trying to make the detail of the of the music the show. And instead, the music is the show. It's just that that detail really accentuates it. And so I personally really like this edition. I also just really like the music. This is not my first time listening to this record. I've This is one of the earliest jazz records that I've ever had, and I've always really enjoyed the music and always really enjoyed Vince Guaraldi. So the fact that they decided to tackle this, um, this, uh, this music, I was very happy about, but I also understand that a lot of people weren't. They were looking for something that was, for lack of a better term, a little bit sexier, possibly by a more, I don't know, maybe more interesting musician. But I, I think that this is, this is really exciting for me, and it's the first time that they've decided to do a piano trio as part of this one step, and I really wanted to hear what they were going to do with that, and I think that this is a fantastic choice, at least for me. So um, let, me, let me just show you a little bit more detail on this thing, because I know people care about packaging, especially when you're spending this much money. Um, so this is, you know, this is the, uh, the, what the, uh, the packaging looks like. I have number 1846. They number all of them down, uh, down here. Um, and, you know, it's not like the, uh, the album is just kept in this. You do get a reproduction jacket, um, which, is, uh, which is also very well done. You know, they, they try to do a good job of, uh, of matching the original. Um, I don't see any issues with mine outside of, okay, there's some flaking on the bottom because here's the thing when they ship. Oh, actually, it's like a two-inch split um, because they, they ship it inside. Uh, they ship it inside this, whereas these days a lot of um, a lot of uh, labels are actually shipping records outside of the uh, of the cover, and you'd think that this would have protected it, but in this case it didn't. Um, as you can tell, me just uh, discovering this right now for the first time, I'm not that uh, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, you still have the outer uh, you have the outer box. I'm not going to send it back or anything like that. It's just kind of one of the uh, the unfortunate things these days about uh, about ordering vinyl. Um, so yeah, th there we have it. Uh, I am excited about this edition. I know that a lot of you are going to be interested in how does this compare to that deluxe edition or perhaps to the MoFi or to the Analog Productions. Apologize that I can't uh, offer you that perspective, but what I can say is that I really enjoy this edition and it is much better than my original pressing. This is one of those examples where I'm actually going to get rid of my original pressing. I don't think I'm going to listen to that blue vinyl version anymore. Honestly, originals don't go for very much money. So if all you want to do is hear the music, you're going to have plenty of opportunities to do that at our 10 or $15 price point. You don't need to spend the $100, but I love this album, and I will say that this is going to be one of those albums, especially for uh, Cast Your Fate to the Wind, that if I have uh, folks coming over and I want to, say, audition my setup, I'm going to play that song because I do think that it sounds just really phenomenal, really, really engaging. So thanks very much for tuning in to this abbreviated review. Go ahead and hit subscribe for me, and I'll see you next time.